All right. As people trickle in, I want to welcome you to today's live cast on how to simplify and reduce cyber risk with managed EDR. Well, my name is Susanna Song. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Highwire Networks and, of course, our, our cyber security division called Overwatch. Well, throughout the next 45 minutes or so, we will have two uh, esteemed sought after speakers uh, joining me. And actually you can see them there, Morgan and Steven, hello there. Good morning. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us for the world. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining this uh, webinar. And I do want to remind um, all of our attendees to feel free to say hello on chat. If you have a question, please, submit those questions under the Q&A tab. And if I do see a, a specific question that, uh, that I, I don't think we should wait till the end, um, I will bring it up. I'll, you know, we can definitely interject um, the conversation and get that question answered for you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Morgan and Steven. Uh, definitely need to read their bios because they both have very impressive bios. So Morgan Wright serves as a senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government. He's the chief security advisor for Sentinel One and the chief technology analyst for both Fox News and Fox Business. Morgan's landmark testimony before Congress on healthcare.gov changed how the government collected personally identifiable information. Previously, Morgan was a senior advisor in the U.S. State Department Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program, the senior law enforcement advisor for the 2012 Republican National Convention. He taught behavioral analysis at the National Security Agency and spent a year teaching the FBI how to conduct internet investigations. In addition to 18 years in state and local law enforcement as a highly decorated state trooper and detective, that's quite impressive, Morgan. Uh, he's also developed solutions in defense, justice, and intelligence for the largest technology companies in the world, including Cisco. Uh, moving on to Stephen Town, he is the Chief Revenue Officer at Highwire Networks, and specifically the Overwatch Managed Cybersecurity Division. He has more than 20 years of managed services, information security, and sales leadership experience, and spent the last 15 years building managed security service practices within several different types of service provider businesses. Stephen is a widely published security services expert and a frequent speaker at industry conferences. He founded Fortinet's Veterans Program and actively promotes veterans transition into the cybersecurity industry. He's also a certified information system security professional. So welcome to both of you. That was a mouthful, but I did not wanna skip out on a, on, on the accolade that both of you deserve and the credibility that you bring to this webinar. So I'm gonna start with you, Morgan, because reading the headlines, I mean, it, it's been quite a, quite a week and actually quite a right. you know, couple of weeks of cyber attacks. We've all heard about MGM. We've heard about Caesars Palace both being attacked. Those are two large enterprises with a lot of money, with, with robust cybersecurity teams. And I'm sure there are many more headlines, right, that we constantly hear day after day. Uh, Morgan, shed light on, on what's happening. I mean, we have a very, very uh, deep, uh, you know, threatscape out there. And, you know, we've got analysts all over the globe trying to solve for the challenges, but we're still hearing about these headlines. So, so welcome, Morgan. Well, thank you. Hey, thank you to everybody out there, especially you, Stephen and Susanna, for putting this on. Stephen, real quick, what what branch were you of the military? Never served. Actually, Navy brat. So my dad's Navy a retired hey, no, officer. Yeah, I was Army. So uh, my dad was Army too. But thank you for doing that. That's it, uh, I sincerely mean that. It's uh, very important to me. Uh, and first of all, thank you guys from on behalf of Sentinel One. We 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 can't do what we do in the market without great partners like Highwire. Uh, and I will tell you right now, everything that we do, our success has been built upon the shoulders of great companies like this, the, our partnerships. So I want to just say thank you, first of all, personally, for uh, allowing us to do that and allowing us to work with you. Um, you know, this is an interesting time. It's an interesting time because 20 years ago, 25, 20, 1999, when I was doing in-service training for the FBI, believe in 1999, the FBI had never really conducted internet investigations. This, this thing we call the internet was just coming around and, and everybody's we had some people saying it's not going to change anything and some people say it's going to change everything well 
they were right both to a great extent. What it has not changed is the tactics uh, and the things, the objectives of nation states, of adversaries, of transnational criminal actors, those things have not changed. Their tactics have not changed. The only thing that have changed is the tools that they use to attack us with. So over time, what I've seen, and um, having done work in both the classified and the unclassified environment, seeing things uh, you know, behind the wall that a lot of people don't get to see, what I came to realize over the years is that a lot of it boils down to the way we think about the problem. So I start off by saying this, the problem isn't the problem. The problem isn't even the way you think about the problem. There's only one problem that matters, and that's the way your adversary thinks about the problem. So let's talk about that just real quick. Let me set the stage from a higher level. If we look around the globe right now and we see what some of the adversaries are doing in tier one adversaries like China, like Russia, uh, and look, folks, do not underestimate North Korea or Iran is probably tier two, but they are persistent about what they do. We see lots of malware attacks. We see lots of strains of malware that are coming out. We see novel attacks, especially coming out from China. Uh, we see some a lot of the big data breaches that are going on. Well, what this does, because you're sitting there thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? All of these things that happen, as these tools get into the wild, they get taken and they get weaponized and they get refined and they get immediately brought to bear against companies like you that are out there. So what you're what you're you're not it's not a fair fight. You're not going into the ring and facing somebody who's a, a, a you know, an amateur, a, you know, couple rounds under their belt. You're going in and back in the day when he was in his prime, you're, you're facing a Mike Tyson, somebody who's well trained, well resourced, you know, a George Foreman. You are facing it's disproportionate. So how do you address this stuff? You address that by partnering and, you know, and bringing the insight. So we see these attacks that are occurring globally. We see these tools being taken and being used now by threat actors at a national, at a regional and a local level. So let me talk real quick to about Caesars and MGM. I, I have, I, I don't purport to have any inside information. I just look at what the reporting is. But when you look at some of the reporting, um, a lot of people, it's kind of pierced this veil of everybody thinking the casinos are impenetrable. They got great security. They do to a point, but the way a lot of this happened, it happened through what I used to teach out at the NSA. I used to teach behavior analysis and interview and interrogation. Believe it or not, the way around many of the sophisticated systems is not compromising the systems. It's compromising the people. Hackers don't break in anymore. <clears throat> they log in. And one of the ways they log in is they get on LinkedIn. They find out an employee who works for the company. They impersonate that employee. They call the IT help desk. Hey, I need some help resetting my account. And then pretty quickly, what happens, Stephen? Um, you're going to be busy for a while, right? Because now we have a breach. So let me kind of, I kind of shape that and just kind of throw it out there to say ransomware is not going away. Um, it's not going away because the profit motive is still there. It's way too high. We haven't figured out a way to effectively address the issue of the use of cryptocurrency. Look, if you can deny them the ability to payment, you take away the incentive to do attacks because if there's no way to get paid, um, there's there becomes less of a reason. And final thing here, and I want to turn it over to you, Stephen, for your thoughts. One of the things we want to do partnering together is we want to raise the bar high enough. We want to raise the cost of an attack to where we can weed out a lot of people that it isn't then you're left with what it is. And when you're left with who it is, then your threat intelligence, your response, the things that you do become more, more impactful for how you make decisions because we're all in the decision-making business. How do we help you make better decisions? So as they say in the news business, Stephen, now over to you. <laughs> well, you know, how, how, do, how, do I, how do I top that, Morgan? I mean, your, your background and experience in this space is, is, is truly impressive. And I think that, you know, what's driving this is, as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the defenders need to be right every time. The bad guys need to be right just once, right? And you've got, you're not facing um, a, 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 a B squad here. You're facing basically some of the best uh, and most sophisticated attackers that are out there in a heavily monetized, uh, you know, industry, trillions and trillions of dollars of, of, uh, of revenue um, that, uh, that the, the bad actors are able to create with, uh, you know, capitalizing on, uh, you know, a situation where the defenders are just, you know, uh, you know, uh, just outgunned uh, from that perspective. Uh, the, the fact that we're not creating and filling the, the, the cybersecurity roles today just exacerbates that situation with 2.5 million, uh, million unfilled cybersecurity positions just the last year. So we're not creating the defenders fast enough to mitigate the risk. Uh, and that just puts businesses uh, of every size at, at, at a real disadvantage. Uh, when dealing with uh, with uh, you know the the types of of uh, sophistication of the attackers, that coupled with the complexity of cybersecurity that we see thousands and thousands of different security vendors out there, 
you know, every customer we talk to is dealing with like, what do I need? How do I defend myself? Where, where do I invest uh, uh, to reduce risk? And uh, yeah, it's a challenging situation for businesses out there today from that perspective. Yeah, and I'm actually, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to push back on something you said, because I push back on it with Sentinel One. I say, you guys, we got to quit using this word vendor. And I'll tell you why. You go to a vending machine, you put in a dollar, you get a candy bar. The requirements are already predefined. You get no say in the matter. You get a couple of choices. This is really an issue about partnership. Uh, when I was in my role as a senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government, we go out and we work with a lot of state and local um, state leaders and stuff. And, and I keep hammering them on that. I said, you don't want a vendor, you want a partner. And so I, I say that all the time, and I'm not not trying to knock you, even though you were Navy, Army. By the way, Notre Dame, my team, my school beat Navy. Thank you very much, uh, just recently. But guys, it's it really it gets into a mindset. Now, let me tell you, let's set up this talk. For, let's let's set this up because one of the things we want to do is talk about. So, what can I do about it? You hit it on the head when you said there are so many jobs unfulfilled. When I go out and I talk to people at the state level or the local level, I say, raise your hand if you currently have a full staff for cybersecurity or even IT. You had it for a year and you expect to have it for the next year. I have not been to anywhere to where somebody except one person, and I think they were not being entirely truthful, raise their hand. Nobody is fully staffed. So how do you do this? One of the ways you level the, one of the levels you weigh the uh one of the ways you level the playing field is we start deliberately applying technology. So, Stephen, let's talk about AI and the use of artificial intelligence when it comes to EDR, you know, uh, endpoint detection and response. You know, because the real question is, how do we reduce risk at the endpoint? And I'll give you a military term. Some of you have heard about it, but we want to get to left of boom. If boom happens, it's bad. We don't ever want boom to happen. Boom is when ransomware gets a toehold. Boom is when somebody is dwelling inside your environment that you don't know that's been there for 18 months or 36 months, right? We've had incident response where they've deployed Sentinel One where we found people in there for two years, three years. So how do we get to left the boom? One of the ways you get to left the boom is you've got to use artificial intelligence. You've got to start stopping the threat, right, Stephen, before it gets into the environment. At machine speeds, right? Because the attackers are moving at machine speeds. So I think that Morgan, one of the thing, one of the leveling factors that we're going to be dealing, you know, experiencing is the is the broad use of of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the defensive measures, similar to what you know what we're capitalizing on with this the Sentinel One suite uh, of capabilities. Y'all are using the, the the artificial intelligence components to to activate and and actualize uh, security at machine speeds because that it's, it's robot on robot today. I mean, that really is what we're dealing with. The bad guys are, are using artificial intelligence to, to uh, accelerate their ability to access and, and, and broaden uh, access into, uh, into uh, networks and, and the defenders are, are doing the, the, the same. So I think it's a, it's a game changing technology that we're seeing put to use on a day to day basis. Yeah, you stole one of my lines. I think you've been listening to me. I always say machine speed attacks need a machine speed of response. If you're relying on humans to respond to a machine speed attack, see Gartner, didn't Gartner have that 11060, like one minute to identify or one minute to detect, 10 minutes to identify your solution, 60 minutes to remediate. Stephen, let me ask you, in your experience, the minute ransomware gets toehold inside of an organization, how long does it take to spread? Ooh, a matter of minutes. Really depends if it's a flat network. In a lot of scenarios, it is. And a uh, matter of minutes, yep. So if you wait 60 minutes to deploy a solution, are you pretty much owned by that, by that point? You are owned. Yeah. You're owned. So own, own is a bad word. So let, let's talk a little bit too about our approach because again, we're not here to do commercials and, and I'm certainly not. I, in fact, I'm not the technical resource. We've got smart people out there that do a lot of that. Um, I'm not the smart one. I'm just the one that talks a lot. Um, so back when I was a detective, I used to get a lot of confessions. People said, was it you're good? I said, no, I, because I would just talk them into it. They say, shut the hell up. I'll tell you whatever you want. So we'll do that here. But, but let's talk a little bit because part of this approach is how do we bring things together? Everybody's heard terms like SOAR, right? Security, orchestration, automation, and response. But, but Stephen, I'm very interested because we partner with you. We provide a lot of the framework, but you build services and you build value on top of that. So let's talk a little bit about SOAR and about how incident response, how about let's talk about reducing risk for the organization because you bring something that I think a lot of folks out there that you need, you need insight. A lot of times what we crave is insight. Tell me, I know what I know, but I don't know what I don't know. That's the most scary part. You know, you know what you know, you know what you don't know but you don't know you don't know something, the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumfeld said, that's the scary part. So how does SOAR, how do you guys use SOAR with Overwatch, you know, and how do you reduce risk with, you know, in your SOC, your security operations center? How do you bring all this together to help reduce that risk? You know, so uh, the, the, the SOAR platform we're leveraging like a SOC analyst. So basically what we're doing with, with SOAR is we're, we're having it go through in machine sequence and machine speeds 
um, the triage process uh, that that a, a SOC analyst would would conduct, right? So we're basically leveraging SOAR like a SOC analyst a human being, but we're doing so in such a way that you know it's moving at much faster speeds. Uh, additionally, you know, SOAR also gives us an ability to really ingest and enrich a lot of different alerts, so we can pull in a lot of context uh, from a variety of different threat intelligence resources, even with uh, leveraging, you know, Sentinel-1's capability, because there's a ton of threat intelligence there that, that's coming in off of, off of that technology as well. But really what we're doing is we're, is we're bringing in a ton of threat intelligence, enriching alerts that are coming off of uh, the technology, um, and then we're taking actions that, in, in many scenarios, we're capitalizing on um, the, uh, the knowledge that we gain from many different customer environments to effectuate security that is the benefit of all customers that we see these types of threats in. So SOAR allows us to take, take in a ton of threat intelligence, populate, enrich, and function like a security SOC Tier 1 analyst, SOC Tier 2 analyst to go through these steps uh, that they take uh, in triaging alerts and understanding what threats are. And then we can take actions in, in machine speeds. Literally, we can touch tens of thousands of devices in minutes and make changes uh, to, uh, to better ensure the security of those devices based on the context uh, and the behaviors that we're seeing uh, that, that SOAR really gives us an ability to look at in rapid uh, succession. You know, and, and this is very important for us, like say from a Sentinel One standpoint, but even from an industry standpoint, when you're a business and many of you out there have been, you're either the partners or you've been, you're the customers of some of the partners that are on the call with us today. When you look at an environment, you're kind of looking at your environment. You might bring in some other sources, but, but Stephen, one of the things I think we do well together is we pull in a lot of data and a telemetry from around the world. You put in a lot of stuff and it's that richness of data. It's that richness of information that allows you to distill all of this and put it into context. And so that you can make a decision based upon your environment. Not every environment is the same. IP is IP, you know, you know, machine computers are computers, right? But you, to your point earlier, is it a flat environment? You know, how do you have it structured? How many people are remote versus, you know, um, remember the old days, it used to be a moat, you know, we'd build a moat around it. By gosh, we would defend that. And then guess what? Work is not something you, a place you go anymore. It's something you do. And we saw with uh, COVID and other stuff, we're now working remotely from anywhere, which brings kind of the question I wanted to talk to you about. Have you had a chance to see the demonstration yet of Purple AI? No, I haven't seen that. We got it. We got to get you. So this is going to be very cool. Everybody's heard of chat GPT, right? This is our own version of natural language model. But to your point, imagine this, imagine the ability to harness all of this intelligence and in like a, a magnifying glass have, rather than having to train people up for five years to become a very top tier security analyst. What about the be able to just simply ask the question, do I have any machines that are vulnerable to CVE X? You know, or tell me, are any of my machines connecting to China that aren't supposed to be? You know, what's the power now of being able to harness all this data, especially from your standpoint and being able to respond to that, not, a, you know, in like a near real time, the ability to make changes in seconds as opposed to hours? That's going to be powerful capability. And right now, one of the things that we are seeing is all of these security technologies that are deployed within customer environments today uh, create a ton of noise and, and, and alerts and notifications and things like that. The bad actors are actually hiding behind this kind of deluge of information that's coming at the defenders. So this kind of technology is going to be pivotal in, in, in helping to level the playing field from that perspective and sort of remove some of the chaff that the bad guys are hiding behind today from the, from the perspective of all the noise coming off of security technologies that are deployed in the customer environment. Hey, I want to I want to have a discussion with you too because um, one of the things we talked earlier about were some of the Sentinel One offerings. Again, we're not here. You know, the biggest outcome for us is not to sell you something on this webinar. That's not it, a product, but it's to sell you on a discussion. Is that there are things that are going to be raised. We want you to have a discussion with your partner. Uh, if you're currently a customer, thank you. If you're not a customer and you're thinking about it, this is where we want you to have the discussion. But part of the ways to do that is let's talk a little bit about how the value you're adding with Overwatch, because we'll provide from a Sentinel One standpoint, things like singularity core, singularity control, singularity complete. And if I went down the list, I mean, I've got the web page in front of me here because it, it's, it's, like, it's like you buy a car and it's like you want all the options, but then you become price conscious. But you guys are doing this in such a way to where you get a lot of the benefits of the base package plus all the options and bringing it down into a single package. How do you do that? I mean, what kind of things are you focused on when you do that? How do you take the Sentinel-1 offerings, combine Overwatch on top of it, and then take an offering back to your partners who then take it back to their customers? 
Well, I, I tell you what, you know, Morgan, if you broke down what a, a smart human, you know, cost is for a security operation, it's, it's cost prohibitive for most businesses to have their own security teams. So what we're able to do is actually leverage economies of scale and the fact that we're leveraging the SOC analysts and the SOC operations personnel to secure and pr protect uh, a larger number of, of, of end customers. So this breaks down the individual cost per customer to, to something in the, the couple dollar range, right? So it, it, the, the leveraging of economies of scale and defending environments for our partners uh, across the board gives us an ability to sort of reduce that cost down uh, for the end customer to, to be able to enjoy exceptional security technology and capabilities, but not having to pay uh, that, you know, the salary of a, of, of a security operations person that can often be prohibitive uh, from a business perspective. You, you, you address the elephant in the living room, which a lot of people say, I love it. In fact, when I used to develop solutions for public safety and stuff at a prior company, uh, which Susanna mentioned, I didn't want to mention other companies, but I was the global industry solution manager for Cisco. So I was running public safety and homeland security. And it was really funny. We'd go out and we'd talk to police chiefs. We'd talk to people in the government. It was always the same three steps in the conversation. I love it. How much does it cost? We have no money. You know, <laughs> and so... We're always addressing, but let me ask you that. Let me let me throw it out, and then let's discuss this for a second. There's always the issue of money, but but folks, a conversation costs you nothing. A discussion costs you nothing, but a breach could cost your business everything. So I again, it's not to sell you anything; it's to encourage you to go back and have that discussion. When when people are looking at price, a lot of times they look at, well, I got to give up something or I got to cut something. I don't think a lot of times we're looking at. I made a statement one time, of which is a lot. People are talking about. They put out a press release on this. Nobody ever puts out a press release, right, on an incident that did not happen. What is the value to an incident that did not happen? What's the value to not having to defend that? One of the challenges we have found, and I want you to address this too, we go in and we're help, we'll go out and meet with customers and we'll, they want to justify spending with Sentinel-1. They say, well, everything's fine. We haven't had any issues. Why are we spending this money with you? I don't know. Why do you still have an airbag? Why do you still have seatbelts? You haven't had a wreck. Let's just get rid of them. Get rid of your fire sprinkler system. When it comes to the issue of cost, let's kind of dig into that a little bit and say, there's a cost for the service. Don't get me wrong, folks. Nobody gives this stuff away for free. Every, you know, We're a business, you're a business. But when it comes to the issue of cost, how do you explain it when you start talking about, to your point, you can't hire your way out of this. So what's the reverse? How do you spend appropriately and deliberately and get a bigger bang for the buck? If I spend $1 here, I can reduce $10 of risk. How do you have that discussion? You know, it's, it's a discussion around value at risk, right, is, is having, you know, and, it, and our partners are engaged in this in that it's a discussion around value at risk. And if the, if the organization understands the, 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 the value of the risk that they're facing, then they can quantify what they should be spending on prevention and, and mitigation of risk and risk reduction. But I think it's important to understand the value at risk. I mean, what, it, what is a couple days of downtime going to do to my business? Uh, what happens if my, uh, my, my, my payroll server or my, my patient information or my financial uh, information uh, is, is, uh, is breached and, and becomes publicly available? What's the cost of that going to be to my business? And, you know, it's kind of a fear, you know, not, not fear, uncertainty and doubt, but it, but it is like understanding what the value of risk facing your business is and, and how to reduce and mitigate that risk and what is a, 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 an investment that makes sense to reduce that risk, right? Because one of the things you can come in and go, hey, look, you're a, you're a medium-sized business. You've got 200 employees. Um, you know, you can be down for a period of time and still function your business. Your your risk, your value at risk may be lower uh, than someone trying to position a lot of security technology that may exceed the value at risk. So I think it's really a discussion with with uh, with the end customer around, you know, hey, what is your value at risk and understanding that because that will help you quantify the types of investments that you need to be making as a business around cybersecurity. Yeah, you know, because there's this misconception, I think sometimes they go, well, we've got insurance that'll cover it. And it's like, yeah, here, here's a here's the dirty little secret behind some of that. The minute you have an incident, I had it explained to me this way, a friend of mine, uh, he was part owner of an airplane with another friend out at our local airport here. And he said, the insurance company, the guy told him one time says, just remember the minute something happens, it's no longer your, your airplane. It's our airplane. So, uh, that's, so that's what we're trying to say. We want to prevent these things because the minute you have an incident, people say, well, I've got insurance for that. Insurance is not a panacea for the things that happened after that. By the way, here's a, here's a quick trivia question for you in an incident who tends to make more money than anybody else. Other the than the bad guys, 
Yeah, yeah. The uh, the insurance companies. Actually, the lawyers. When you look at the legal fees that are go with this, and then so you've got disclosure notifications. You've got you know the, the required disclosures. You've got PII issues. You've got. Uh, risk from potentially lawsuits if you're a publicly traded company, you know, shareholder suits, you've got reputation risks, for example, like uh, MGM, the, again, reporting uh, anywhere from eight to $25 million a day is what they're losing in uh, revenue. Well, you think, okay, we'll get back on. Well, you, folks, you're not going to gain. It, once you lose that revenue, you don't get it back. They don't, people don't come back in and say, well, I couldn't play the machine for one hour today. So I'm going to play it for two hours tomorrow and get you back your money. That's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. Right. So, I think one of the things, the question I wanted to ask you about too, is when you've seen these things happen, there's two kinds of businesses. One that understand that, hey, this is the risk and we have to spend appropriately. One that go, yeah, we understand we have the risk, but we hope that, uh, you know, it sucks to be somebody else. We just hope it isn't us, right? When you've seen the people that kind of take this second approach that haven't uh, insured personally, if not from an insurance standpoint, but they haven't spent appropriately to mitigate the risk, what have been some of the long-term impacts you've seen with some of the businesses? The ones, the ones that suffer a breach, unfortunately, uh, you know, you've got small businesses dealing with the fact that 60% of small businesses are out of business within six months of a breach just because of the cost of a security breach, and they're and they're they're baffled by it, right? They're like, well, I'm a small business, I do, you know, I, I make shoes or what have you, or I'm a, man, a small manufacturing company, and then they they realize that you know a breach costs them six to eight hundred thousand dollars, and that and that becomes an existential threat. I think the other aspect is, is that I think customers that have been breached in the past have, have, have failed to recognize the, the, the cost of lost business as a result of the yep. breach. It's it, that 40, almost 40% of, of the cost of a security breach is actually lost business. It's not all the mitigation. It's not the credit reporting. It's not all those things. The biggest sum impact of a business is lost business as a result of it. And I think you're going to see, you know, granted, I'm sure a lot of people are addicted to gambling, regardless of what MGM does, they're going to be back there at the uh, pulling the, uh, the one arm bandit. But for most, for most businesses, the fact that, you know, 38% of, of the cost of a breach is actually lost business. I think that's the one that's, that's often a surprise to many customers that go through this kind of experience, unfortunately. Well, that was an interesting point too, because during the pandemic and during the other stuff, they looked at the cash reserves of small businesses, how long could they afford to be out of business or have their doors closed? And we saw, unfortunately, you know, a couple of my favorite restaurant stuff never couldn't make it, right? So it's the question of how long you can survive. But I, let's, let's kind of go back and talk about from a solution standpoint, though, because I'm interested in picking your brain about a couple of things, too. When you're looking at it, you'll, you'll have a small business. It's like... Um, how do how do you help them understand the risk? In other words, what are some of the steps when we want to talk about deploying EDR or endpoint protection and we start looking at that stuff? What are some of the key things a business should be thinking about as they think about deploying a solution? It's not like, well, let's just throw a software package on everything and check the box and say we're done. That's not really done, right? So as they're thinking about it, whether you have something currently in place like legacy AV or you're looking at updating and upgrading, you, you got folks, we got to pull you out of the dark ages and you know, bring you into the light. And the light is a traditional AV is dead. It doesn't work. Um, it, we've got to, how do, so how do you take them on that journey from where they are now to where you want them to be and understanding along the ways, maybe you start off uh, at, at control before you go to complete, or maybe you do certain, you know, or kind of in that vein, but you're bringing an entire package. How do you have that discussion with them? And what does that look like for somebody sitting in the audience right now? Yeah, it's a risk-based discussion. It's understanding where the where the where the customer is at from a security perspective today, and where they need to be from a risk reduction perspective. And and there is no overnight becoming, you know, magically perfectly protected. I mean, there, the, that that's just not a reality. So in, in many scenarios, it's a phase a phased approach at risk reduction um, that is mitigated and, and associated to where they're at today. And, and I mean, every company out there in the world has made investments around cybersecurity. The challenge is that a lot of them is, it, you know, they, they perceive that the investment they made even three years ago is going to be uh, enough to keep them out of trouble today. Uh, and that, that is part of the discussion is kind of where are you at? What are you using now? Uh, you know, what's the risk that, it, that is acceptable to you from that perspective? Uh, and then we start talking to them. And our partners are a huge part of this, right, is, is they're actually having the, the discussion uh, uh, with the customer around risk reduction, where they're at from a technology investment perspective and where they want to be from a risk perspective. And that's often a phased approach. So to your point, you know, Morgan, it, it could have started with, with Sentinel One Control. It could have even started with McAfee. I mean, it could have started with, with a lot of different investments that, 
even you know three years ago would have seemed to be a good investment today are not are not you know uh, uh, adequate to to defend businesses. So generally, it's a discussion around where's where where are you at from a security perspective today, and and where do you want to be from a risk reduction perspective and a risk mitigation perspective, and that really is how that conversation generally starts. Yeah, I, I was I, I actually started off a few years ago. I did a thing for the National Defense University. It was a, a studies and observation group kind of, but we were tasked with saying, "Hey, how would how would Russia invade Ukraine in the future?" And this is 2013, right? Came up with some things to think about. Uh, changed it a little bit because of the uh, uh, December 23rd, 2015 uh, attack on the Zaporizhia hydroelectric plant. But I but want to give people why do what I want to talk for just a second about why what happens globally matters to you locally because. Many of the tools that were developed, for example, um, if you don't understand your adversary and you don't understand why they do what they do. So I asked, I asked a lot of people, why did Russia pick December 23rd, 2015 to attack Ukraine, Kyiv, take out the Zaporizhia hydroelectric plant, put 750,000 homes in the dark? And I got lots of answers like, well, it's Christmas, it's this. No, you got to understand your adversary. They attacked them because exactly one year earlier, December 23rd, 2014, Ukraine voted 303 to 8 to change their status from a non-aligned nation to an aligned nation, and you have to be an aligned nation to join what organization? NATO. This has been, go folks, this has been going on for 200 years, so the reason I say that, um, my next kind of thing I'm working on is what can the Chinese spy balloon teach us about cybersecurity? So remember the cy Chinese spy balloon incident? Well, they said it was a weather balloon. Let me tell you what it was first, and this is, so here's the analogy to cybersecurity. You're thinking, we're okay, we've got no problems. Along comes a weather balloon. Why did China send a weather balloon to begin with? Because if it was caught and discovered, and they, they were testing our capabilities, they're testing, can you detect this? What's your ability to detect? Had they spotted the weather balloon, it truly would have been a weather balloon. But when they exploited that, it's called the domain awareness gap. See, civilian traffic kind of ends at 40,000 feet, you know, and then you go up way past that. So over the United States, you don't really start worrying about things till about 120,000 feet. There's 80,000 feet of airspace there. How easy is it to hide a 300 foot tall balloon with something even the size of a bus in 80,000 feet? It's going to look like the angel dancing on the head of a pin. The reason I bring up this historical kind of or this way of looking at it, this is where you're getting exploited. You're thinking about the world. This is the way I think about it. It goes back to what I said. Nobody cares how you think about it. All we need to care about is how does the adversary think about it? And so when we've seen these exploits happen, Stephen, a lot of times people go, well, I, I did. Why, why are they attacking me? Right. You know, I thought I had this right. One of the values of bringing something like Overwatch in or bringing this thing, you know, we need to talk about, too, is about how your managed security service provider or your MSP. How do they support your incident response? How do they support you with business continuity? So let's kind of have a little discussion on that, because I know we're going to be running out of time soon. But I'm also interested to say, how do you support? How do you do those things when you do have an incident? I tell you what, you know, the, the, the value of the, man, the, of the managed service provider partner that is engaged with and supporting the customer is critically important to uh, any of these phases because uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, you can put the best security measures in place. That is not going to stop a bad actor from finding a way in. They are, they are so good at what they do. Uh, it's, it's about what happens when something does occur, right? And, and, that, and the, on, the boots on the ground capability that partners provide uh, in addressing uh, incidents as they arise, being able to drop in and identify and assess the situation from, a, from an end customer perspective, evaluate the affected environments, uh, the, the servers and the applications and everything else, and then determine what the root cause uh, to the incident was. Um, those are those are critical things that the managed service provider partner and our partners out there are able to do as a, as a critical part of this of this uh, uh, th this support capability that um, that that is you know not the least of which the security technologies being used in the security operations center that are you know seven by twenty four three sixty five um, it's it's the feet on the ground it's the boots on the ground in the locales of the the end customers environments that really make the difference in reducing risk. Uh, and 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 providing a level of cyber resilience, which you know I think is a term that is going to become more and more important, and that's basically being able to you know recover from uh, cybersecurity incidents. Um, that is critical. The the value that the partner brings to being on the ground from that perspective is something that really puts makes makes the uh, you know makes the cake, if you will, right? If you're trying to figure out how how to get the the risk reduction and and institute the risk reduction aspects. That partner being on the ground to be able to support the technology and, and support the incident isolation uh, is a critically important part of, of, of uh, reducing risk for the customer. 
Well, you know, you know when things uh, become relevant to the industry, you know, in Hollywood, they start hitting the mainstream. I was just trying to think of what was the name of the show Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston are in. It's on Apple Plus. It's the uh, it's the daytime show network or something. But it, it's if you guys have been watching this, guess what? It's the morning it, show. The morning, the morning show. show. There it is. The morning show. Thanks, Bridget. Bridget. Guess what happened on the morning show? I don't want to give it away, but the network goes down. You know why it goes down? Ransomware attack, and they want fifty million dollars. When when Hollywood, when the networks start covering this stuff, it is now so mainstream that it's now become plot lines for these shows. Right? We don't want you guys to become a plot line. Um, let's talk about one final thing because I know we're going to run out of time here. But let's talk about XDR. You know, there's EDR. You know, all of these X's, right? But what is the value? I mean, for us, the value of threat intelligence, it's preventing it before it happens. You know, if, if, you, if you're issuing a press release, you're too late, right? You never issue press releases for something that doesn't happen. But talk about the importance when you start pulling in things like the vigilance piece of it, you know, and other stuff. I mean, the and the watchtower, you know, you start bringing all of this stuff together. How does that, how does that enable these folks that are listening, these small businesses, to, to do a better job of deciding what's best for them? key is visibility, right? So uh, XDR basically brings together some technologies uh, that, that include that, uh, that visibility component, the security information and event management piece of being able to see everything that's out there, being able to bring in and ingest the uh, types of security telemetry from all of the areas of the customer's environment, and being able to put that into what we would call a converged security data lake, and leverage machine learning to actually isolate behaviors across that, similar to what the Sentinel-1 uh, complete capability does on the endpoint, XDR is doing that across the entirety of the attack surface from, from the customer's perspective. So really what it is, is it's extending detection and response functionality to everything else outside of just the endpoint. And that's really where things are, at, are, are, are evolving because you know, you've got so many different security technologies that are out there. They're not designed to actually work together. So they're not working together to better secure uh, the customer's environment. And what XDR does is really provide the level of visibility, uh, the, the ability to isolate behaviors across the customers, uh, the different technologies, the firewalls, the cloud, the collaboration suites, et cetera, and to be able to take machine speed response actions to all of that, not just the endpoint. So that's really where XDR is the evolution of, of you know, endpoint detection and response to cover the rest of the attack surface. And that really is, um, I think it's one of the best security measures a business can take today is having XDR in play because it does take into account all of the different security technologies and get those technologies to actually start working together. They were never designed to actually work together, you know, because most customers that we're dealing with don't have a single security vendor for everything that they do. And, and that's the reality, right? So being able to get those technologies to actually work together into a cohesive defensive strategy is really key. And that's where XDR comes in. Well, you mentioned something about data. A real quick point. Everybody remembers what happened with solar winds, but you know, one thing's the way the Russians thought about this, the GRU, the military arm, is that they realized that at that time, most people, you would take a, you would take your update in, put it in your sandbox, watch it for three or four days. If everything was okay, you'd put it into your operational environment, collect, keep data for two weeks because storage is expensive. If you've ever got one of those bills from a company, I won't um, name, but it ends, it sounds like funk. Um, but if you've ever got one of those bills, right? Uh, so what did they do? They waited till the 15th or 16th day. And then they popped up their little periscope and they looked around and they say, are we in the right environment? Can we turn, they were able to turn certain companies off, uh, not Sentinel-1, uh, point, of, point of rights, it's in the Senate record. They were not able to tamper with Sentinel-1. But to your point is it's the data. Some of the value is in being able to store that for a longer period of time to go back and say, when did this start happening? When did this start occurring? And, and I will, I will just throw out something to think about. One of the ways you justify and rationalize, like say, I'd love to spend this, but we're spending money over here. There are ways to reduce your spend on more expensive data storage solutions. Bring that in so that you get the value of all of this, right? So with some areas like folks who use Splunk, you can either bring it in, we've got adapters for that, or you can use data set, right? Drop your bill, sometimes 50, 60%. And then be able to switch your spend from uh, storage right into the actual uh, e, you know EDR solution. What is the value of having historical data when you're thinking about making decisions and looking at how have we done and where do we need to go forward? Morgan, you and I have been in the cyber business for a while, so it used to be indicators of compromise were kind of what you were looking for, right? Now it's indicators of behavior. And if you can't see that data and you don't have a, a, a lengthy period of time that you can actually look at that data and look for behaviors in the data, 
um, you're not you're not going to be able to mitigate the kind of risk uh, that the attackers are, are dealing with, you know, that are bringing to bear today, right? SolarWinds was an excellent example of a supply chain attack. We're going to see more types of supply chain attacks, and really the only defensive measure is having that data and being able to isolate and, and identify behaviors, not indicators of compromise, not necessarily signatures for malware, et cetera. It is looking for behaviors, and those behaviors are very clearly defined within the MITRE attack framework. So it's, it's, it's out there. That information is out there. But if you cannot see and you can't search for behaviors across large data sets and do so at machine speeds, you're not going to be able to keep the bad guys out of the environment. Well, I see Susanna has joined us. That's our indicator is that this is like your captain. <laughs> That's wrap it up I'm going to put on your seatbelts. Uh, we're about to land. I figured this would be a nice cue because we did get two questions and I want to make sure the two questions are answered in case uh, they, the answers run a little bit long. The first question is, I am an end customer in need of an endpoint solution. How does automation play a role in EDR? Isn't the solution already detecting and responding? Count, I know you touched on it, but if you can reiterate. Well, I'll throw out one point because the smart guy, Stephen, can tell you about it. But re really, folks, it's, it's about this, is that do you want to wait and have a human have to react to something at machine speed, which is exactly what you're talking about? Or do you want to be able to respond at machine speed to a machine speed attack? It, uh, the, the value of automation is reducing the cognitive workload on people so that at the at the, at the, at the uh, base of your pyramid of security and stuff, the people are doing a lot of the work. They don't get overloaded with alert fatigue and other stuff. You want to automate a lot of the stuff so that by the time it surfaces, they're dealing with high value actions against high value activities is kind of the way I looked at it. Yeah, and I, I think the question is, you know, like, you know, Sentinel One completes fantastic technology that de detection and response is in the name, right? Um, so where where does automation uh, add into that? And to Morgan's point, it's about actually leveraging an automated security operations center analyst to go through and triage and look at things that are behavior oriented, right? Uh, and so that's where automation comes into play from that perspective and being able to see I mean, one of the, the, the beauties of the technology is, is it sees a lot of things and it's thrown off a lot of, 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 of information that needs to be uh, uh, asked, you know, threats need to be ascertained from a, a lot of these, the, a lot of the information coming off of the technology and automation is used to actually triage those things uh, and do so in a rapid fashion. So it's not just about pushing down, hey, quarantine that file or, or you know, quarantine this endpoint. It is like, hey, bring in all this threat intelligence and then give me some context around what I'm seeing coming off of uh, the endpoint there and do that in an automated capacity. It's not just about the response actions. It's actually about functioning like a, 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 a SOC analyst would in an automated capacity. Yeah, I heard earlier today that, you know, the the amount of threats SOC analysts are looking at today is like looking for a, a needle in a haystack of haystacks. I mean, they're just, we are inundated with data. So and Susanna, you can't expect a human mind to be able to detect all of those threats. That is one of the things I used way back. I was doing work in the intelligence community prior to 9-11, but even after 9-11, they say, how do you find the needle in the haystack? I said, you guys are approaching this wrong. You want to look for the needle in the haystack by making the haystack smaller. Waste of time, use a bigger magnet. Automation is a bigger magnet that pulls the needle out of the haystack of haystacks. Quit searching for stuff, have it brought to you so you can make intelligent, dis sorry that you can tell that's a soapbox of mine. <laughs> we spend, we waste so much time on activities that are a waste of time as opposed to, I want smart people focusing on big problems, not small problems. That's I why that. SOC tier one analyst burnout rates are what they are because it's just a, you're dealing with so much data and you, you're petrified that you're gonna miss something. And if you're not using automation to go through and, and to ascertain where the needle is and what needle needs to be looked at, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's critically important aspect to automation. Historical, right. uh, historical perspective, go back and watch the movie, The Andromeda Strain. I don't know if any of you have watched that. It was a sci-fi movie from the 60s. The scientist who is looking at slide after slide actually gets an epileptic fit because just all of this stuff, trying to go in and see it all at the same time. You, you, what you People forget there's a human factor to this. The burnout rate, when you lose an analyst, how long does it take you to find, hire, and train somebody to come back in? These, these folks are very important. They're, they're an important resource for your organization. What do we do to lighten the cognitive load and the emotional load so that they can perform at a high level? Yeah, we got uh, always one attendee saying, yep, yeah, I've watched that. So uh, last question. I want to get this answer in before uh, the end of the hour. What is the difference between getting complete from... Overwatch versus S1. So it looks like 
uh, what's the difference between getting Overwatch managed EDR versus S1 complete? So talent, why, why don't you take that one? Yeah, sure. So, so it gets back to what we're doing in the Security Operations Center and how we're leveraging the automation components uh, and the ability for us to ingest and enrich the, the alerts that are coming off of Sentinel-1 uh, technology, being able to pull in a variety of different threat intelligence feeds to add context around the kind of behaviors that we're seeing coming off of the S1 capability is key. Um, the, also, the function of the 7x24 response action. So when we see something bad happening, um, we're taking action, whether it's Sunday at midnight or whatever it is, and that's that is, you know, probably really the most valuable component to what the Security Operations Center provides. Um, that uh, eyes on glass and the, and the eyes on the threat condition and the uh, and the response actions that are taken in the SOC really are the value, right? You're adding the human component to, um, you know, the, the cybersecurity threats state uh, and the security response capabilities by human beings that are that are taking action. So I think that's probably uh, probably the key value that the Security Operations Center adds. All right. So final thoughts, uh, because we do have uh, the raffle winner. So we used our little automation uh, tool to um, take all the attendees, not registered, so only people who actually attended today's uh, live webcast will be able to win. And we have one winner. And I, and I, I wasn't lying. It wasn't just a marketing thing. We actually have this Yeti that will be shipped to one lucky attendee. So I want to make sure that I get to that. But I wanted to get final thoughts from both Morgan and uh, Stephen Talent uh, before we wrap today's webinar. So do you want to start, Morgan? And then we'll let sure. Talent go after. And uh, Frank Butaro also had a quick question I'm going to answer in the terms of this, because you brought up something really good. Thoughts about training. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the key things. This is about people. This is not about bits and bytes and ones and zeros. At the end of the day, this is about people, people who defend and people who attack. And one of the things I love about what Sentinel One does, one of the things I love about what uh, uh, Highwire does with Overwatch, there's a lot of training components to this. It's not just throwing it at you and vomiting on you and say, go do this. A lot of ways to help you understand what you need to do. So, you know, so for me, it's like, um, this is a team sport. Cybersecurity is a team sport. We're defending critical infrastructure. We're defending um, our way of life. I, I don't want to sound dramatic, but folks, I threw up the morning show to make you understand once it starts getting into the mainstream like that, it is so embedded. There, there is no ripping and replacing of networks. Mm -hmm. We will be living with the internet. We will be living with connected things for the rest of our lives. Uh, I grew up where there was nothing connected. Uh, three channels on your TV. And if the president was on, like one comedian said, the night was over, right? So now we've got unlimited things. But that's the other thing too. We have we have connected so many things to this world. A lot of times we don't have a good idea the cascading effects that if something happens here, supply chain, right? What are the cascading effects? So many things. We cannot go about this the way we've always done it. If you keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you've always got, which means traditional approaches with traditional software and legacy thinking gets you into trouble, gets you into problems. Would we like to work ourselves out of a problem? Yeah, but it'll never happen. Why? Because bad guys and girls are not going away. Threat actors are not going away. This is a 24-7 problem. This will continue to be. And unless you are on par, unless we're leveling the playing field, you know, trying to make sure that we can respond as fast as they can attack, we never want to be behind. We always want to be at least on par. And a final thought for me is the value of a partnership, again, is building that wall brick by brick high enough to where you can't, you know, we're not going to say you're going to stop everything, but we've been so good at stopping so many things. We want to make the cost of an attack so great on the attacker, they go elsewhere to do it. And because they realize trying to get into you is too tough. Yeah. So, so to your point, Morgan, I mean, I don't know if anybody remembers the club, right? You put it on your steering wheel, you know, and, and, and then all and they like, did was saw through the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> it took two minutes. It took two minutes to saw through the club, but that was two minutes that was not required for a vehicle that didn't have the club on it. So they would pass you and go to the vehicle without the club because even that two minutes was made the, the, the cost of an attack higher. And to your point, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, the way that businesses are defended today, the cost of the attack is so low for the operators, yep. bad actors, that, that it makes it, you know. So with all of that said, though, you know, I think we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, bad things happening to businesses, et cetera. This is not an, an unsurmountable challenge, right? Um, this is something that, you know, the cybersecurity risk states can be reduced for businesses of all sizes by taking some of the more common sense measures that we're talking about today. The technologies like Sentinel-1 Complete 
um, the security operations center and your managed service partner that are out there understanding your business and, and secu- helping you secure your business, these are not insurmountable and these are not billions of dollars of cost to the business. It really is an ounce of prevention that, that could really mitigate and reduce risk in a big way. So again, I think we talk a lot about bad things happening. Uh, this is not an insurmountable challenge, uh, and, and really, it, it, it is an opportunity uh, to protect your business in a way that is cost-effective, economical for your business, and makes a, a, a lot more sense than the alternative of, of hoping that something bad doesn't happen to you. Yeah, and Harold, you said it nicely. You don't have to be impenetrable, just impractical for the bad actors. There you go. And guys, Spot the on. next step, you know, one step that you can take immediately after we end this session, guys, is reach out to the IT or MSP provider or partner who invited you to this webinar. If you don't have one, I'll put it in chats where you can find, um, you know, Overwatch is more than happy to help you find a partner, uh, but don't take the burden on yourself, right? Take the complexity out of cybersecurity and put it on that MSP and partner with someone you know, there's a talent shortage, it's too much data. We know about those business problems and you don't have to put it on your backs, right? And you can do it in an affordable way. So please take that next step and reach out to your partner.